Welcome to Conscious Life Spaces Conversations Podcast. My name is Amy Adams, and I'm your guide on this journey today. Today, I had the opportunity to speak with Laura Valente. She is a movement medicine teacher and facilitator, sound and voice therapist, artist, and coach. And we discuss movement as medicine. There is energy that is locked in the past and the stories of the past. Mm -hmm. So that is literally life force that is trapped. Right. That life force, it, it is eventually trapped in my body, in my cells, mm-hmm. in my posture, in the closeness of my chest. Perhaps I'm not even breathing enough when I fall mm-hmm. in that place, either because something is triggering me or because there is a memory or because there is a pattern that I'm uh-huh. holding. So through movement, so there is really a dynamic right. you know, component here. Through movement and through repetition, we free that energy. Before we begin the interview with Laura, I just wanted to take a moment to um, tell you a little bit about how medicine movement is defined uh, in the general knowledge bank. Movement medicine is without the need for dogma or belief. It's meant to give people tools to integrate the freedom and aliveness of the dance into daily life. It's a kind of meditation practice intended to create an experiential and embodied connectedness with the world. I asked Laura to take some time to introduce herself to the audience and to begin to tell us about her journey into movement medicine. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, first of all, for having me here with you today. Hi, everyone. Uh, My name is Laura Valenti. I am Italian. Uh, I am living in Spain at the moment. I am in the south of Spain. Uh, I moved uh, with my partner about uh, a year ago after we got uh, tired of uh, uh, life in the big city. In the last few years, I have been traveling a lot and I spent a lot of time in South America. And that for me was an opportunity really to connect to nature at a deeper level. Mm -hmm. So after that, I really felt that I needed to move in a rural location and have a different lifestyle and Mm -hmm. quieter connect to a slower rhythm and to be closer to the cycles of nature. So, um, so how did you, did you always have an interest in movement and music? Was that something from childhood or did you yes. evolve into it or how, what happened there? <laughs> well, there was certainly an evolution and it was a, a very long journey, which uh, actually it did start during childhood um, because uh, of the family circumstances I was living um, Uh, My mom, she died when I was very young. Uh, Mm -hmm. I was six and I was living with my dad and my grandparents in a pretty uh, traditional, I would say, uh, environment in Italy Mm -hmm. in the in the 80s. And um, and uh, the first instinctual connection I had uh, with music and and with dance, uh, it was as a child and uh, I would put on all the crazy music like heavy metal and I remember dancing to Iron Maiden or Guns N' Roses as all strangest thing really for a child. I would lock myself in the living room, put the music, you know, full volume and then I would sweat and sweat <laughs> and dance and dance and dance and dance until I was exhausted. So I would say that that for me was a pretty natural connection since a very early age and probably a very spontaneous way to really release stress from my nervous system mm-hmm. you know so it was also something that literally allowed me to survive uh, difficult yeah. years so from that then I was when I was younger I shifted to going to the discos and nightclubs and uh-huh. that included also in a uh, in a certain period of my life, it included also being in drugs and alcohol. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so I was relating still to the need of moving my body in a way that it wasn't uh, completely healthy. Mm -hmm. um, till my, during my late twenties, actually mid twenties, uh, I came across the um, original, an original, I would say, form of ecstatic and folk dance, mm -hmm. uh, which is Italian, uh, pizzica and tarantella. Oh. And uh, through that, through that, I met a possibility to start uh, slowly wow. relating to my body in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, I was aware that I was holding a lot of tension in my body and I wasn't free in my movement as much as I would have liked to. And I was aware also if in those years I wasn't reading books and nobody told me um, that for me that was also a metaphor. And I was longing at a very deep level for that freedom of expression in other areas in my life. Uh -huh. And uh, I had an intuition that if I was able to unlock the freedom of movement in my body, I would have been able to apply that also into daily living. So the journey started with the Italian dances. I was still in Italy at the time. And then uh, during university, I was uh, cultivating an interest while actually I was studying law into theater uh -huh. because I had an understanding of uh, um, physical theater and physical practice uh, into theater as a way to actually strengthen the muscle of awareness uh -huh. and uh, experimenting with spatial awareness, with movement in the space, with opening, in the, bo opening the body. Um, and so after a number of circumstances I moved from Italy to Hungary I studied circus there and then from Hungary while I was working also in an NGO I went to London and in London I studied physical theater uh, until I got cancer so wow. um, I got cancer in the same age in which my mother died actually so she died when she was 34 I get cancer when I was 33 Mm -hmm. And at that time, I started hearing about the five rhythms and uh, also about the School of Movement Medicine. And so while I had cancer, uh, I, I met, uh, actually a little bit before, I met my teachers, the founders of the School of Movement Medicine, Susanna Jakob Darlingkan. Mm -hmm. And so, as I used to say, I danced my socks off also during cancer and uh -huh. between actually chemotherapies because I had also partially conventional treatment. Uh -huh. And so... After that, I continued uh, the relationship with the, with the school and with this body of work. Mm -hmm. And so I knew also that uh, I wanted to do an apprenticeship first with them. The apprenticeship program is more about, uh, let's say, personal process and healing. Uh -huh. And um, it's, a, it's a wonderful program. The format slightly shifted. Nowadays, in, in those years, it was like an 18 or six, 18 months program, actually, uh -huh. divided in many modules to really call in the vision and the dream in this reality about who we want to be and what is it that we have to offer and how can I strengthen my relationship with myself, with my resources, through movement, Right. in order to be who I am to the best of my abilities. Uh -huh. And then after that, I trained also professionally with the School of Movement Medicine. So now I am a teacher and a facilitator qualified. And I trained also in sound therapy and voice therapy uh -huh. because I had a strong passion and interest to really bring together movement and voice. Right. So this is the story in right. a nutshell, the journey wow. so far. So when you were, so as a child, you had this kind of release with the dancing and it really was cathartic for you. And then as a young adult, you also had this uh, experience of cancer. And do you feel that this kind of movement uh, really aided in your healing journey? Or, um, do you, or do you think that if you hadn't uh, found that expression that things could, I mean, obviously we don't know what's going to happen, but like that it could have maybe not been as uh, cathartic. I mean, you wouldn't have that release or something. It was definitely part of my healing journey. 
and I am uh, aware also about how delicate this topic is and how mm -hmm. mindful we need to be when we speak about these topics. Right. Um, in terms of also making suggestions. I'm not a doctor, so I'm just right. sharing my experience. Yes. Certainly that was a key part uh, of my journey and of my healing process. And there were many, many layers to it. Mm -hmm. um, so there is more than one aspect that I can relate to it. Uh, one of the aspects actually, uh, which is included, it is also um, the presence of community. So we have a community of peers and uh, companions and students and older students and teachers as well. So not only in that journey, I had a possibility, as I said before, to strengthen my resources. Mm -hmm. um, I suffered for a very long term, for a very long time in life for, from acute patterns of self-hatred and self-neglect and lack of self-esteem. Mm -hmm. So what I was doing through movement, it was that I was strengthening and I was practicing my capacity to trust myself, mm -hmm. my capacity to love myself, uh, the, the, the playfulness that it was in place also to include more imagination and how through movement I can actually experiment, actually literally with new movements. So that again, it becomes, I see it sometimes like a kindergar kindergarten, uh -huh. you know? I am experimenting with my movement and I am moving actually in a new way. How? Oh, how interesting. Mm -hmm. I haven't known this movement before in myself. Right. And this for me as well is a metaphor. If I can find a new way of being in my body, my chest can grow and I can relax. And uh, my fingers are moving in a way that I didn't know before. So right. there is more to me that I didn't know. Right. There is more about myself that I can play with in daily life and daily circumstances to develop a new language, mm -hmm. a wider vocabulary of response when I need to meet life and its challenges. Mm -hmm. So this is based uh, on a very basic understanding, which is about we all learn through repetition. So mm -hmm. through this practice, we repeat, 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 repeat in movement. We repeat a lot. And uh, children do that, you know, how long does it take for a child to learn to put the spoon in the mouth? Mm -hmm. So as adults, we need, for example, to learn new postures, you know, new ways of feeling at home in the body mm -hmm. to align our spine and, uh, and so on and so on. There are so many examples. Yeah. And as I say, that there was also the key aspects of being in community and being with peers and being in a safe environment where people mirror each other in a very loving and supporting way. So, you know, it's like uh, very important. We all hear how important it is to love ourselves. We all hear that. We all know it. We say also that I can't love myself or I need to love myself until I'm really able to love somebody else. Mm -hmm. And yet I have to say that in my experience, this is a circle that actually it is very open and it feeds itself because in that community, I was uh, given back love in places of myself where I didn't know yet where that sent love was, mm -hmm. but somebody else was giving it to me. And somebody else was giving me also a lot of support and trust and uh, encouragement. And to an extent, sometimes that was shocking to my system. Like, wow, are you guys really trusting me so much? Because I don't trust myself. Are you really doing that? It was uh -huh. disorienting sometimes. Right. But to receive that mirror constantly in a steady way and that presence, it really helped me to strengthen my own muscle of self-trust right. you know so it just doesn't go just one way and right. then i was able to give it to somebody else right so there was there is a lot of um, support so, so you had some kind of but when you were receiving this from other people was it like this kind of doubt like that maybe you weren't worthy to receive that kind of love or 
maybe, I mean, I obviously, I don't know, so I'm asking you, but, um, or did you just feel like, uh, maybe, like maybe you expected less of people, so you were kind of shocked by the fact that they could do that for you? I, I, I was really surprised, you know, I was surprised by the amount of love and trust that mm -hmm. I received, and I think that somewhat in these places, because because the space for me was very safe, very, very safe. So that meant that the wounding and the tender places and the trauma was really there, you know, it was part of it and all the tenderness. And yet there was part of me that was longing so much, not just being loved, but being seen and being received, you know, that, um, to an extent, I feel that I wanted that so much that uh, I allowed myself to receive it. Uh -huh. It was challenging. It was difficult sometimes, but it was because it was so steady. It wasn't just happening once in a while. Right, right. It was steady. It was there. And, uh, and I was supported also into growing my own responsibility. Mm -hmm. So, for example, within the community, you know, we would have tasks or things to do, you know, sometimes in a very practical way to set the space or do something or lock the doors or very simple things mm -hmm. sometimes so that was for me a way to allow myself to believe it somebody's trusting me right. i'm not going to let them down mm -hmm. you know somewhat i was coming from a place where maybe i would let down myself if it would be only about me right but i'm not going to let down another person so i'm going to do my best to to be in a place of integrity and I'll do my best. It doesn't mean that I got it right all the time, but because this was a practice in relationship, it wasn't just me sitting and thinking how much I need to love myself. Right. I would have never managed to do myself to do that, to be honest with you. Right. And to say the truth, I remember that actually from having my dog, <laughs> you know, <laughs> when I was in my twenties, I was a mess. I had no idea whatsoever of how to take care of myself. I didn't know. I knew I was a mess. Sometimes mm -hmm. I would go like this and say like, oh my God, I could feel it. I had a perception, a perception of the journey I had. I knew it was going to be long. <laughs> I knew it. I was yeah. like, I am in such a mess. This is not going to be something that I'm going to solve in one day to another. This is going to be a freaking long journey. Mm -hmm. And yet, what I was not able to do for myself, I would do it for my dog. Mm -hmm. For the love of my dog, of taking care of her. And yeah. then she has been actually my first teacher. Yes. Because I learned that in order to be <laughs> taking care of another living being, I need to pull myself a little together, at least a little bit, and be yes. responsible for somebody else. Yes. So that which I wouldn't do for myself, I would do it for the dog. And so is the same when we are with fellow beings and peers and you know friends and um people who help us grow together mm -hmm. so that was my experience it is still my experience i learn a lot when i am in community and uh, it's the greatest school that i attended a school of life and i don't mean just you know the movement practice right, uh, i right. mean also being in this context where we are together and it doesn't mean that there aren't challenges there are you know right, it doesn't course. mean that there aren't conflict you know right but a community yeah i think having a community um is something that is challenging especially too just for people in general because of how we live now and mm -hmm. um i think especially in city life sometimes it's mm -hmm. harder even though there's tons of people around mm -hmm. um it's very challenging to find a community and then when you do hopefully you can you know, maintain and nourish it, but people keep moving mm -hmm. too. This is very, yes. uh, I think this is something that I noticed like when I lived in the United States, even though you have a community, ultimately people because of opportunities or life, they move to different places. So it's kind of a, you have to find other ways to make community now, I think. Yeah, uh, definitely. Past. Like we are not so, um, 
I mean, even though we're more connected in some ways, we're disconnected. So um, I just find this, and the dogs, I have two dogs, but I have, I've always had dogs my entire life, but one dog in particular was also a teacher for me. So I completely <laughs> relate to that because there was a time where I was having a lot of challenges, which also took a very long time for me to get through. Um, but she was the, the, little being that helped me to uh, find my way because really I could totally understand like, like if it wasn't for her, I didn't have to do anything if it was just for me because I was at a point too where I didn't have that kind of love for myself. So I, I really, I think probably a lot of people listening might have the same experience too. So I actually encourage mm -hmm. people for, to have care for an animal, especially a dog, because they're so loving and they give you that undying affection. And um, yeah, it's just so amazing. Now, I would like to just take a quick moment to remind you that there is a resource library available to you. There are downloadable meditations. There are some workbooks on gardening. There are a lot of different tools to help navigate this uh, beautiful and complex world. You can uh, access the resource library when you subscribe to the newsletter. Go to this website. It is getit, G-E-T-I-T dot conscious life dot guru. I will put the link um, here and also in the show notes. Now, let's get back to our interview with Lauda, and she's going to tell us a little bit more about the community and how they sometimes actually all gather together as well, a bunch of the facilitators and teachers and others um, in larger events um, besides their smaller communities. We have usually a summer gather, which, gathering, which is called the uh, summer long dance where we dance for 72 hours, we <laughs> fast, we sleep very little and we raise money for projects all over the world including the rainforest. Wow, so that is one great. of the gatherings. There is another in winter and then there are different ways for people to come yeah. together or some, sometimes we also go together to continuous professional development. So there are many ways. Right. right. And the sense of community and support is really strong, very strong. Okay, so I actually have a question though, because you said so it's like a 72 hour uh, where you dance for 72 hours. I mean, that kind of makes me think about the shamanistic aspect of what this mm -hmm. plant medicine has. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, a, mm -hmm. I don't know what you call, uh, like, I guess it's like a journeying or something that you would consider, mm -hmm. like somebody goes to a shaman and they go through some kind of journey. So in a way, it's kind of, is it like that? Like a kind of... Um, it's, a, it's a yes and no. It's a uh -huh. yes and no, because there are many uh, school of thoughts, let's say, nowadays. Uh, uh -huh. We personally, particularly with the uh, teachings of uh, Yaakov, uh, we oftentimes say we are not journeying anywhere. We are not going to go anywhere because most of us are already pretty much out there and spaced out. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, the journey, the journey that we do, it is back inside. Right. in the body, right. in the ground, in the feet. So the practice is uh, shamanic for uh, many different reasons. You know, mm -hmm. there are different uh, texture and colors. One of the aspects, it is that there is uh, an understanding of the interconnectedness of all life. Mm -hmm. So for example, we dance a lot with the elements, with the prayer, with the focus, with the understanding of practicing the relationship with the elements mm -hmm. within and around us. Right. So we are made of earth. We right. are made of water. We are sun. We live out of the sunlight. We cannot live without the breath and so on. So we really relate to shamanism in a very practical way. Uh -huh. And um, we also... Uh, relate a lot to the uh, important aspect of reciprocity, which is related to the interconnectedness of the web of life. Uh -huh. So we as teacher and as practitioner have uh, 
also a commitment, I would say, to give back right. to life, strengthening the cycle and the circle of giving and receiving. So, for instance, the ceremony I mentioned, mm -hmm. it is really a giveaway ceremony. Nobody is earning about that money. Right. And uh, it doesn't mean that me or we as a group are not included in the healing and in the prayer. We are. And right. yet, at the same time, we are giving back to life. We are celebrating gratitude and we are supporting charities and projects all around the world. Uh -huh. uh, we work also with the ancestors, uh -huh. for instance. And uh, we work a lot to strengthen this relationship, to celebrate it, to honor the life force that comes through them. Uh -huh. And to reclaim the relationship um, with the lineage that oftentimes this kind of relationship is being lost in this part of the world. Right. So there is understanding also of uh, systems and systemic issues, you know, mm -hmm. because in this contemporary culture, particularly the Western culture, which is so, so, so individualistic, it's all about me, right. you know. So we want to bring in actually the relationship with the web of life at all levels. Right. That, for example, it includes also the relationship with the past and with uh, mm -hmm. retrieving energy from the past as medicine. So we don't look at the past by saying that the past, it doesn't exist. Right. We, are not, we are not saying that there is no trauma or that the hurt is not there. And yet we look at ways to relate to that energy use it and channel it in a creative way so that we can offer it to life to support life uh -huh. and again again our life included so from a shamanic point of view if i am talking in a way that hopefully is not too boo boo as people uh -huh. say <laughs> there is energy that is locked in the past and yes. the stories of the past mm -hmm. so that is literally life force that is trapped Right. That life force, it, it is eventually trapped in my body, in my cells, mm -hmm. in my posture, in the closeness of my chest. Perhaps I'm not even breathing enough when mm -hmm. I fall in that place, either because something is triggering me or because there is a memory or because there is a pattern that I'm uh -huh. holding. So through movement, so there is really a dynamic right. you know, component here. Through movement and through repetition, we free that energy we really want right. to have that energy moving in the body allow movement because movement is a key part of life there is moving mm -hmm. movement everywhere in our cells in our organs in the atoms it's part right. of life so we want to tap into that natural intelligence right. that lives within us to activate it to strengthen it to awaken it so also that which is painful, it can be given back to life as an offering and as right. something that is creative. Right. So that can become healing yeah. know, for ourselves and for all our relations. So this yes. is another aspect to the shamanic understanding. Yeah. We really bring in relationship with the past, with the present, right. with the future, with the descendants, mm -hmm. with understanding that what I do in the present it has an impact on the future generation. Right. And another concept, if you want, I hope I'm not throwing too many No, 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 actually, because the ancestors, no, this is actually great. I, with the whole ancestral history, because I feel like the reason why I even moved here actually had to do with the healing of my grandmother because she didn't want to go mm -hmm. to the United States when she went and mm -hmm. was cried mm -hmm. for days when she arrived. And I, and I don't, I like after I moved back to like the region where she grew up, I feel like that was something to do with my ancestral, the mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. like a healing, um, mm -hmm. like like a coming full circle. So, um, and I do feel like the our history, like we're born with it in our DNA, and so these things that have nothing to do with us um, as individuals in our current lifetime, I think it's our obligation. Uh, well, I don't know about the obligation, but like to heal ourselves from these things, to mm -hmm. kind of break the cycle even of the kind of yes. traumas yeah. of the yeah. past that's mm -hmm. um, 
so and I love that and because I know that like since our body is just uh this thing that is holding our life or our beingness that um like to to I like the idea that you're coming like that you're getting in touch with who you are and your inner self and you don't have to go to like uh you know have a hallucination or whatever <laughs> to to no. heal right no. <laughs> it is actually about sobering up uh-huh. sobering up and coming back here right yeah, well, I mean, I think there's this kind of thing with a lot of practices, like, like we, you know, when we want to go on like our self exploration or healing journey, I think sometimes we can get so far afield that we forget about our life on earth. So that mm-hmm. to me is something that like, I, you know, like we all have to kind of find like, it's good to go there sometimes to kind of heal yourself. Mm-hmm. But at some point, you have to live on earth that's what <laughs> that's where we are so so i really i i just find this so fascinating so um so when you if i were to go to a workshop that you offer and now uh-huh. i know that um when we previously spoke that you said sometimes people go for just like a two-hour workshop or they can go to something uh-huh. where it's like several days almost like a retreat but uh-huh. if i were to go uh-huh. to a workshop that you were doing what what would i expect uh-huh. to well, at the moment, I'm teaching uh, very simple classes, like uh, dropping classes, like a two-hour class, very mm-hmm. simple, um, particularly because I'm new in this community, and so it is the practice. So what you would expect, it would be to come in the space and have a gentle warm-up uh, at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And then um, after that, I would gather the people in circle and share a few words to welcome them, to ask them you know, if they're new to this practice or not, or if they're familiar with other movement practices and so on, if there is anything going on in their bodies that they need to know. Mm -hmm. Um, And then uh, I would take um, a journey (laughs) into the elements. I work a lot with the elements. Mm -hmm. So there would be a warm-up first and a practice that we call uh, Awakening the Dancer. Uh So this is a practice to really bring back the mind and the tension and the focus really like zoomed, you know, laser clear attention into the body and see what happens, you know, and see what happens. So this is a way to really strengthen, you know, um, attention actually. And in other words, to strengthen also knowing self, Mm -hmm. you know, at a very deep level. And then after awakening the dancer, where people also can pair up sometimes, so mm-hmm. they would uh, discover together, for instance, uh, the dance of their feet together or their hands. Uh-huh. So we would, you know, tune in um, physically with the fluidity of the spine, exploring different movements of the spine, mm-hmm. uh, the pelvis and the elbows and the head and so on, until the whole body is warm up because we want to make sure also that the space is safe for people to really go with the movement so the body needs to be really warmed up properly. And after that, uh, we would dance uh, with the elements and through the elements. (laughs) So there would be an invitation also through a very specific uh, choice of music, you know, that is supportive and Mm -hmm. inspiring um and also grounding for example if we're dancing with with earth so oftentimes i would play music you know with percussive instruments Mm -hmm. and uh, so we would explore this relationship and so it becomes a practice really of uh, meditation in movement what is it my relationship with earth Mm -hmm. inside me it could be a question or how earth wants to move to move through my body Or what do I need to do to bring more balance in the relationship with the earth around me? Mm-hmm. So it's really a personal inquiry where I would offer some questions in the space right. or I would offer some um, invitations or some instructions that would be as physical as possible and movement related. So to really invite the people to be in physical space and practice rather than being in the realm of concepts. 
So if people are not moving a lot, then I invite them really to explore this through your body. And what is the difference between earth moving and fire and how fire wants to move? Mm -hmm. And so then Mm -hmm. we would move with water and with air. And what is the message in there? And where do I need more balance? Mm -hmm. What another question would be, where somebody is feeling more at ease somebody maybe feels very at ease with her and that air and then maybe they don't know how to move with her right. so there is an information in there right. that if we are paying attention that is telling me something about me if i'm feeling a little bit awkward hmm, right. maybe there is a deeper invitation here with curiosity you know what is this telling me about my state of being you know right so, so there are many keys to read this, yeah. Right. So you're kind of, I mean, so in one way, there's kind of a creativity, like this point of uh, where you can kind of go inside yourself and then transform like energies that were within you. And then you have uh, like being in touch with the elements and then finding like where you might need balance or have an imbalance, right? Yes. So this- Yes. Yes. In a very simple way, people may yeah. understand that they need to improve the way they eat, mm-hmm. or somebody may understand that they want to join an organization that is taking care of the water. You know, it's mm-hmm. very, it's a very personal inquiry. Mm-hmm. And at the personal level, for me, there is something about also really strengthening the muscle of imagination. What does it mean not only to move with fire? What does it mean if I am the fire? Right. And how do I use that energy to create? Or what does it mean to become water when in front of events and circumstances in life, I need to shift and maybe I don't need to be rigid. I need to be suddenly more fluid. Can I embody that? Right. So there are many ways to really translate these skills into daily living and also opening up the imagination in daily life because I think that this is another plague if I pronounce it well yes. of our contemporary society which is shutting down the imagination yeah so this is a way to reclaim also the power the healing aspect of vision and imagination mm-hmm. you know to strengthen our resources and the relationship with ourselves and each other and to really uh, imagine new ways of being and living with each other yeah in, I, the, in the planet you know we need a new story and it right. starts with imagination that you know it right. starts with imagination. <laughs> yeah well i think the whole kind of uh dance can i mean once i think in the beginning like for me i'm actually very self-conscious like publicly dancing until you know and i know like um i'm not i know many people are sometimes i mean you know, sometimes you could go out. I don't really go clubbing anymore, but like when when I was younger, if I did, you know, I'd have a drink or two, and then I, uh, your um, inhibitions are lowered, so you feel more free and open. And then other people are dancing, so you're in an environment. But um, I think this kind of shattering of your identity and like it, it's not even a shattering. It's not uh, of your own identity, but of like the expectations of others. Uh, Mm -hmm. maybe might happen too because people like they see you as a certain way and you're so used to like almost performing uh in life um as like at work you're one way and maybe in your family you're another way and this and you don't uh you're not maybe so free uh and creative so i i love the idea of dance of giving you this way to uh become creative again and then to mm-hmm. take that into your life and mm-hmm. I, I think it, i i mean mm-hmm. i i've never i did take dance classes when i was younger not obviously not anything like this but um when i was younger and i loved it it was so liberating and so great because you were with mm-hmm. a bunch of other people who were doing it too and so you you were in a place where nobody was going to make fun of you or um you didn't Mm -hmm. have to present yourself as something else to the world Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. so i and uh i did actually when you were talking about the postures earlier too about how people present themselves with posture like that you can be aware of that um 
uh, our dance instructor used to tell us when we sit on the subway uh, seat to make sure that our spine was like up. It was a good way to practice to kind of like shape our spine and to be aware of like how we're sitting and stuff. And so I, I really, I, that does make a difference too about how um, you hold yourself. And you had mentioned that when uh -huh. we first spoke. So if you could, I know we're kind of uh -huh. running a little bit late here, but if you wouldn't mind just talking uh -huh. about that for a moment, as kind of uh -huh. <laughs> about. Um, well, you know, um, I'm thinking about also some tips that, uh, uh, I can give yes, know, for, that people, actually, for people to practice at home. So one first thing to do, it could be, it's very simple, actually. Sometimes things are simpler than we think, you know, really change position or change posture. So if I notice that uh, I am shrinking, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm starting to go in my head and preoccupied and all of that, uh -huh. maybe one simple thing we can do Stand up, <sighs> roll the shoulders, roll the shoulders a little bit, feel the connection with the sky above, feel the feet and maybe put a hand on the heart also. Mm -hmm. So it is really about shifting and changing, creating change sometimes in a very basic level. A friend of mine once told me that a younger, the yoga teacher, was asked uh, what to do with depression. And he said, uh -huh. lift your armpit, <laughs> <laughs> which can be a joke, you know. Uh -huh. And yet I heard also Anna Alprin, who has been one of the pioneers and visionary creators of, you know, um, dance as a healing practice, saying, you know, when we feel a little bit down and depressed and First thing, change posture. Feel mm -hmm. the connection with the sky. Feel the spine. The connection with the ground. Maybe roll the shoulders and relax the shoulders. Yeah. And for people sitting on the computer a lot of time during the day, maybe, you know, stand up. Because we tend to mm -hmm. shrink a lot. Also with our shoulders, creates a lot of tension in the neck. Maybe have some intervals between being, you know, in between and take a little walk and have a little stretch and make gentle contact you know right. with your body and uh, as I said there are many ways of reading it uh, right. you can imagine that you are a tree we have this practice also the tree of life uh -huh. you know where we feel and imagine and envision the roots going down down in the earth to feel the strength of it uh -huh. and to receive also the support and the nourishment that comes from the ground. Mm -hmm. And then we tap in the fluidity of the trunk, which is the heart, and then the connection with the branches and the sky. Mm -hmm. I've done this before talking to you today. Uh -huh. I, wanted to be, I wanted to be ready right. for this interview. So what I've done, I went in my tree of life. Uh -huh. and That's beautiful. Fat my, That's nice. Fat my feet and my heart and the connection with the sky. Uh -huh. And the deeper the roots, the stronger the branches and the heart in between. Yeah. And uh, the last thing I can say, and I know that for experience of living in London, actually, we all know that also breath is key. Mm -hmm. So I would really invite people to pay attention to their breath, particularly mm -hmm. if they live in stressful environments. I know for myself that oh, I would contract a lot in the city. So I would invite an awareness to paying attention to how people are breathing. Mm -hmm. And when they're noticing that they're holding the breath to... <sighs> yeah. Yes, really exhale. I catch myself sometimes. But I'm really not consciously breathing. And it's just... <sighs> bare minimum sometimes and and that i could feel it like in here mm -hmm. sometimes because yeah. there is obviously a whole physiology and mm -hmm. chemistry that is being affected when we do that mm -hmm. so really connecting to the breath exhaling and then when there is a lot going on in the head and preoccupation you know put a hand on the heart trust <laughs> in the good heart yeah. and feeling the feet 
on the ground. And yeah. I know that this it depends on the practice of the people who are listening to us. So to some people, this may sound quite natural and obvious. To right. others, it may sound a bit stranger. And yet when there is a lot of stuff going on, worries, anxiety, for mm -hmm. me, first connection is right. with the ground. Because right. when there is a lot going on here, it means that I'm not really here. Right, right. And the first, the first two things I can do to come back <laughs> is to right. feel my feet. Uh -huh. Eventually, I can even stamp it as I'm doing it now. Oh, yeah, that's <sighs> And breathe. Yeah. And exhale. And put a hand on my heart. Right. Because it is also heart practice, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I actually, I love the tree idea. I mean, I know in, uh, in yoga too, they have tree pose and all of that, but, um, I, in, mm -hmm. I was actually in Northern California right. and I got to visit the redwood trees, which I've never had that experience mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. So it was so incredible. And I crawled into a tree, you know, where actually you could fit maybe 10 people in that tree just inside wow. and, uh, stand and standing up too, not even, um, uh -huh. so we crawled in and it was very exciting but one of the things I learned when I was there um, is that there's like a whole all of the roots of the trees have uh -huh. uh, they uh -huh. they uh, they communicate with one another all the trees uh -huh. and they uh -huh. actually uh, work in like community so I kind of love like this idea of the tree even it just kind of just it's such a beautiful metaphor for the uh -huh. whole I uh -huh. know, being it in is. touch it is it is. Yeah. We are connected to the intelligence of life much more than we think. So yes. much more than we think. Such an incredible intelligence within us and around us. And actually we are part of that. So I want to thank you today for having a thank conversation you. with me. It was so amazing. I love it. And I know that everybody that's listening is going to really learn a lot. So I also want to, um, do you want to just share your website with everyone? Soon. It's called uh, Elemental Soul Medicine. Elemental and that uh, Medicine. includes the work I do with sound, uh, also in voice therapy, with movement medicine, and with work that I'm doing also online. Uh -huh. I will have a one-on-one -on -one mentorship program online. And then people can check also for local uh, movement medicine classes because there are classes in all Europe, not yet in the States, but there will be, uh -huh. I'm sure, soon. And my teachers also travel often to the States. The movementmedicineassociation.org website where all the classes are listed uh -huh. and... Uh, there is an explanation of the practice and also uh, there is an explanation about the code of ethics that we embrace as professionals. Mm -hmm. So, well, great. Thank you so much. Okay. So Thank bye you. everyone. Bye. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. If you have any questions, please send them to hello at consciouslife.guru. Now, before I sign off, I'd like to ask you to subscribe to the channel of YouTube if you're here or to the podcast on whatever platform you're listening. And please leave a review. It means a lot. And don't forget to check out our website, ConsciousLife.Guru. Until next time. Music in this production includes God Fury by Anno Domini Beats, Birds by Silent Partner, and Cast of Pods by Doug Maxwell.